Hello, beautiful people. So, uh, hey, I'm back by popular demand. I keep getting you guys' messages about making new videos. And uh, so I decided to come back and share some more stories that I believe are going to help you as you continue uh, towards your desire to get into a law enforcement career. So today's video, we start with uh, discussing salaries. Um, a lot of you questions, uh, some of you are out of state and I'm based in California. My law enforcement experience was in California and so maybe I could share some stories with you about salaries. And then uh, some of the other requests are to discuss more about the field training officer program and uh, some of the things you could do to improve your chances of passing the, the field training officer, the FTO program, and then uh, some tips for you to uh, complete police reports in the shortest amount of time possible. So we'll start uh, with that list. So the first topic that I want to talk to you about is salaries. And so for, for those um, in California, we are experiencing a very heavy shortage of law enforcement applicants. And I attribute this to a lack of understanding what the job is all about a combination of a bunch of toxic videos uh, playing bad cops making poor decisions over and over again and the media simply bashing on law enforcement and what we all stand for uh, please keep in mind before I start talking about salaries that the majority of law enforcement uh, individuals are hard-working dedicated uh, men and women who every day of their lives uh, Put their uh, life you know on the line to protect communities throughout the United States so a lot of you see these videos and you think that every single person out there in law enforcement that's what they do but in actuality that is not what we do the majority of us do follow department policy are caring and want to uh, improve our communities so having said that if you are the type of person that wants to improve your chances of getting into a law enforcement career, make really good salaries, keep listening as I have some tips for you. The first story that I bring you uh, includes a Oakland police officer, uh, Timothy, that basically you can go online and check, uh, I believe his last name's Logan. And uh, in 2020, his base salary was $134,000 a year and he made $300,000 in overtime. So if you add that up, you know, $435,000 salary a year is not bad. Now, a lot of that has to do with working overtime. So his base salary was 134,000, you know, minus taxes, of course. But if you could do the math, that's a little bit over 11,300 every month without salary, without uh, overtime. So the salaries in California have never been so high. I attribute that uh, in terms of salaries because agencies are having a difficult time finding qualified applicants to join the ranks. People that are willing to go through the training and learn how to become a law enforcement officer, whether it's a deputy sheriff, police officer, high patrol, state patrol, etc. But so uh, keep that in mind. So some agencies are offering bonus, hiring bonuses other agencies are uh, doing, uh, trying to recruit college students like the ones I have in the classroom to uh, do uh, internships, paid internships, and that is certainly one way for you to get into a law enforcement career. So if that's where you are and you want to hear about it, uh, go online to post Peace Officer Standards and Training that's the uh, you know the website it's post.ca.gov you can click on hiring click on list of agencies it's alphabetized and it shows all the agencies out there that are hiring please don't make the mistake that a lot of my students make and they want to just work for one agency they ignore all the other agencies and uh, the background investigator sits on their freaking application for eight months and then they get a letter hey you weren't selected so that is the dumbest move you can make if you're trying to get on as a police officer deputy sheriff california high patrol 
do not apply to just one agency. That is a huge mistake. So my advice, pick nine, 10 agencies, large agencies, avoid small agencies as they tend to be very political. Not to say you can't apply to them, but just keep that in mind, the word political. And having worked in those, I have a lot of experience on how political they are. So anyway, that's my tip. Um, researching some of the highest salaries uh, online, you know, San Francisco, Oakland, Sunnyvale, those seem to be the highest ones. Uh, Sunnyvale is not that busy. It's a really nice community in California. But if you're starting out in law enforcement, like I did, I, I enjoyed working for a large agency where you're going call to call and 11 hour shifts goes by pretty fast, right? So the number two thing that I told you I was gonna to talk to you about in this video is the uh, field training officer program. Um, I've been, you know, since leaving law enforcement, I've been teaching uh, criminal justice courses. I have a whole array of the type of students that wanna get into law enforcement. Some of them wanna be, you know, uh, prosecutors. Others wanna get into corrections. Others, you know, a mix of, you know, getting, working in police records, sheriff's departments, etc. So it's a whole mix of things, but um, it, it always comes up, the conversation will comes up, hey, uh, once I pass the academy and I get put into a field training officer program, uh, what are some of your tips? Now, I did create some videos on this a while back. I encourage you to go back and look at those videos. Uh, some of the comments are interesting because some people really don't agree with what I'm saying. Again, every department's different, so I can't, you know, elaborate on every single department, but having worked as a field training officer while in law enforcement, as a police officer, I can tell you that a lot of the stuff that I'm telling you here still exists today and has not changed. So, the first point is to understand that this person who's training you is going to try their best to try to get you through the program. Now, they are a human being and they have flaws, and so you need to probably try to ignore the flaws, see what you can learn from them, and then see about improving your own uh, quality of police officer, deputy sheriff, etc., so that you can get past it. You are going to be in that program for four months. You're gonna be rotated uh, uh, you know, through various shifts, day shift, swing shift, night shift, night cover. You're gonna be rotated through various training officers, FTOs, and so each of them with a personality, each of them with a different goal of what they want you to learn. But you're gonna have a binder, and that binder, years ago, it followed the uh, San Jose Police Department training guide. That binder, you know, on a scale one through seven, uh, will measure how you're responding to training. Your first day on, you're totally green. You're not doing everything, obviously, that a police officer would do. Even if you are a, tr a, a lateral officer, coming from a different agency. Obviously, you don't know everything about this department, so you need to really uh, pay attention to what you need to do. You need to read the department policies, know them inside out. You need to read the operating procedures. You need to read the uh, officer code of conduct, and you need to listen to your training officer. When you go to a call uh, for service, you have to, you know, if you're telling a good story, in the car and the radio comes on, what I just did, you have to pause and to listen to the police call. So you cannot simply carry on your conversation even though you're fully immersed. You have to train your brain so that you can pause and then engage in what you're supposed to be doing, which is responding to that police or sheriff's, you know, law enforcement call for service. So that's that's important to note. So keep that in mind. Now at the end of every shift, the hardest part is the daily observation report. It's constructive criticism at the very highest. So you believe you did really well on the first day, but at the end of the shift, your training officer, your FTO, will go through all the bad things you did. So maybe a couple of good things you did. You know, you, were, you arrived on work on time and you were wearing a clean uniform, and then all the bad things you did. You forgot to get the person's information, you forgot to take charge of the call, you had poor officer safety, you were driving too fast, you were driving too slow, whatever. And so understand that those are observations that you need to go home and really work on, right? So that when you come back the next shift, you don't make the same mistakes. The goal 
is so that that list, the daily observation report, bad things gets reduced as you get closer, you know, into your second month, third month, fourth month. So that's important. You cannot simply ignore those uh, points, go home and forget about them on your days off. You have to go home and really improve on those, you know. How can you listen to the radio better? How can you drive better? How can you know the operating procedures? You obviously have to do extra work to learn and, and memorize all of these things, right? Now, the, the, the third thing I was going to talk to you about was police reports. Uh, and a lot of you are intimidated by this because, you know, in, in high school or whatever, you just didn't write police reports. You were like, man, you avoided writing at all costs. And please, uh, don't sit there and say you didn't because you may have, maybe one or two of you out there listening to me, you know, loved writing. But the majority of the people that I get in, come in contact with, especially now as a college professor, nobody wants to write and they want to see the shortcuts. So I'm about to tell you the shortcuts, so please pay attention. So there's a repetitive two police reports. There's a, a repetitive procedure to police reports. And so if you respond to a residential burglary and you do a report on a residential burglary, the next one will be very much like this residential burglary report. I mean, dates and times are different. You know, the items that were stolen are different how the suspect broke into the house or different, etc. But for the majority of the time, a residential burglary report will include a, uh, you know, when did the person leave to go to work, last saw the TV was there, when did they come back, notice the TV was gone, other stuff was stolen, any idea who could have done it, did you talk to the neighbor on both sides of the house, behind the house, did you ask if anybody had, you know, CCTV cameras, uh, security cameras to see if anything was captured on video so that's very important so keep that in mind as you uh, as you conduct your investigation obviously right so don't forget to give the victim you know your little business card with you know the case number so that they can call and they can ask you know if you have the questions leave a voicemail for you etc etc so what about other calls and I'm just gonna kind of ramble other calls for service uh, a petty theft report you know a lot of times it can be handled over the phone a lot of times agencies now are asking people to go online and and file the report online okay etc etc but the crutch of police reports begins with you understanding first of all how the department wants you to investigate that specific call so for example a alarm call you know you know, if you're the first officer and there's two officers, who takes the very first corner of the building? You know, who takes the second corner? How do you communicate to, with the other officer to, you know, guide him or her into the, you know, possible crime scene so that you guys are safe? It's all about officer safety. When I used to teach report writing, the things that you have to understand, the what happened right what happened like do you have a summary of what happened you know synopsis of what happened okay who was involved how did it happen when did it happen you know where did it happen when did it happen etc those are questions that need to be in every police report so i remember when i first became a reserve officer before becoming a full-time officer i would turn in a report and the supervisor would look at it and say you know you're missing an important point here. And I'd say, well, what am I missing? And they he would say, well, look at it, read it. So I'd read it and then, I, oh, okay, I forgot to put when the victim left for work and the last time she saw the item. He goes, exactly, so go ahead and rewrite it. So if you read a police report and it's missing some information, obviously you're not following the who, what, where, how, when, and why, if you can answer the why. And so keep that in mind when you write police reports it's a short story right and we have to do it in chronological order what happened first what happened next and then what happened and then what happened and then what you do and who did you interview and what they say and what evidence did you collect and are you gonna forward the report to detectives I mean what, what's gonna happen with this report what's the disposition of this report is it gonna be sent to detectives for more follow-up is it gonna be suspended because there's no suspect information, there's no evidence, etc. What's going to happen, right? 
on major reports, major incidents, right, like rape, uh, like traffic accident with major injuries, there's a lot more responsibility level that you have to keep in mind. If you get arrive at an accident with injuries, you obviously have a responsibility to call for medical assistance as soon as possible, and you have to control the crime scene. You have to you know, uh, you know, reroute traffic. You have to get on the radio. You're this incident commander. You have to just jump up. You can't just sit there and freeze and like, oh, what do I do first? Officer, uh, you know, officer safety is always first, but when you get to a call like that, a major call of an accident with injuries, obviously you have to call for medical assistance, right? And describe what, what, what you have. You have, you know, seven people injured. You need three ambulances, that kind of stuff, right? On the rape call I mentioned earlier, you obviously have to collect evidence. You have to take the victim to the hospital to get a rape kit conducted by medical staff, collect all the sheets, make sure the victim doesn't you know, shower, etc., etc. And so depending on the call, you have different guidelines that you will follow. But I assure you that after you write a police report and it is repeated several times, it's, it's gonna be the same type of, of, of protocol the location will be different, the times and dates, the victim's name, obviously, the suspect's name, everything. But so how do you prepare for this, by the way, right? Some of you are like, okay, you tell me all this stuff, but I, I'm struggling. What do I do? I think you should go to the police records section and talk to somebody in records and find out who, which officer writes the best police reports. Now, these records people there, the staff, they read a lot of police reports and they know which officers or which deputies write the best reports. And so you need to find some off time, off duty time, and go into records and ask to pull some of the reports from these officers so that you can read how they write their police reports. Read how they write their police reports. And then after you review different sets of officers, find your own individual way of writing these police, police reports. So don't, don't just uh, get into a silo, a little bubble, and you know, hunker down when you get constructive criticism. You need to pay attention, because this is very important. You've gone to the police academy, you've learned how to shoot, you've done dexterity skills, and you're physically active, and blah, 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 but now you're in the field training officer program, and this is a make it or break it, and you cannot relax until you're completely off of the FTO, and then you're off of the uh, probation, and then you can relax a little bit, and then boom, you're on autopilot going to these calls. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the video here shortly. I do wanna encourage you to continue sending me ideas for videos. I'm going to start discussing uh, topics such as the post pellet B exam that all the agencies in California are now requiring you to pass before you even apply to those uh, you know, public safety type of positions. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna also talk about, in California, the physical activity uh, that's required, the requirements for you to pass before you can make it through the academy, etc. But I do want you, the viewer, to subscribe to my channel to, uh, because you wanna be able to be reminded when I post, you know, hit the bell so you're, you got the notifications on and then share it with somebody else that you know may be going through these difficulties, whether it's, oh my gosh, do I decide to do this career or not? So anyway, I wanna be able to continue sharing information with you. Uh, I'm glad I'm back. <laughs> I, uh, I, I did take a pause there for a second and uh, I wanna continue because it is my goal to make you a successful individual in your career so that you have a prosperous life, you have a job security type of career, and uh, stop listening to the media, stop following conspiracy theories, and instead find somebody like myself and others who are here on YouTube to improve your skills to get you into the desired career that you've always dreamed about. All right, so take good care of yourself, and until the next video.